Okay, hey, once again, I'd like to welcome everyone here. I'd like to thank everyone for coming down to pay tribute to our good friend Eric Keith and a life well lived. So thank you guys for coming down here to pay tribute to Eric. We would have loved to see all these people showing up here. I know there are hundreds of other people around town, around the country, around the world to which they could be here, but I'm glad hey. you guys were able to make it. If people could uh, take a seat now, we do have, uh, like I said, some food up here, drinks in the back. If you haven't gotten food yet, welcome to sneak up while we're speaking. Yeah. But I'm not going to speak much now, I just want to start things off with some of Eric's oldest friends. Uh, I'll just mention for those who don't know me, uh, my name is Brian Quinn, I'm one of the managers here in the theater, and I've also been a friend of Eric since 1990, and over the last 12 or 13 years, so... Eric and I have done an adventure, and we've definitely called the Ryan House Film Festival going back a number of years. But uh, I'll, speak a little, I'll speak a little bit later, but I want to mention some of Eric's oldest friends and family members at first. But again, the reason we're all here, obviously we've got a great crowd here because uh, more than anything else, Eric was a great friend to me. Um, and, you know, Eric loved film, loved wrestling, loved rock and roll, especially in the 60s, rock. and through his love of those things, you know, he used that as a way of making friends, you know. I've always, you know, I've spent some time, like many people who've known Eric, you do spend, uh, he wasn't a dealer in posters, he was a dealer in information and friendship and, and love for all these things that he loved. And so many people I've talked to have said, you know, I first met Eric, my first trip to L.A., and, you know, went to a store, talked to him for three hours, and we've been great friends for decades ever since. So, and because of that, we have so many people here because they were friends with Eric, and people from all his world that he loved are here too, because of Eric's great, great heart. Uh, watching you know, what people have been posting on Facebook the last couple of weeks, I've gone through hundreds and hundreds of things people have posted on various forums and on their, their Facebook sites and websites, and the words you see over and over and over again are kind, sweet, generous, and that's really what Eric was. I mean, to me and everyone else I know, Eric really was just a big part of and we're all here today. Uh, I'd like to bring up a few people. We do have, um, I do want to mention, we do have um, some of Eric's family here. We do have his brother Bobby here with his family. He came in from Texas. <laughs> we do have Eric's cousin Rob Rukoff here too. So we've got some of Eric's family up here in the front row. And I'm going to just call up a few people. For those who haven't given me your name yet, if you do want to speak at some point, just come up and see me throughout the event. I'll put your names down. What we're going to do, we're going to have people come up and really talk about Eric and maybe tell some stories. And I don't think it matters if the story might be a little uh, goofy, funny, or embarrassing with Eric, because a lot of Eric's stories are about goofy and weird stuff that happens and when you're hanging out with Eric. And so anybody who does want to speak, who in any way was touched by Eric, by his friendship or anything, certainly give me a name if you haven't already, I'll call people up. And what we're going to do, because we're really here, this, is a, this would be a church for Eric. So this is, this is kind of the, really the ideal place to hold the celebration for Eric is in a movie theater. And as you can see, we put stuff around, posters for a lot of kind of movie, a lot of movies that Eric loved. We got a little memory board up here with photos of Eric. Uh, if you know Eric, many of them, he's wearing Mexican wrestling masks. But you know, rest assured, you know Eric, and it is Eric behind that, that mask somewhere. We've got some stuff outside also. And hopefully you guys noticed too, we did mount the, um, the original Hollywood Booking poster, Neon Sign is out there in the lobby too, so maybe get a picture of yourself with that. And what we're going to do is we're going to have people come up and talk about Eric's speak. And then interspersed throughout, I did put together some um, film material, kind of mixing throughout, just to sort of, you know, sort of give a sense of what Eric loved and the things he loved. So I do have um, two short, like 10, 12 minute trailer reels with trailers for films that Eric loved. And then we'll be closing out the, um, the whole thing, because this really should end on a positive note of happiness, laughter, and love. We'll be ending this out with um, a Three Stooges short also towards the end. So I want to invite up a couple of people first. First off, I'd like to, if he's um, ready to say a few words, I'd like to um, bring up Eric's old friend and also somebody who's worked at Hollywood and posted for many years, Scott Tisch. Scott Tisch. Sitting at the 
the kitchen table. My mom had made him coffee and breakfast and they were like having a conversation. And he was like a family member and eventually like my mom, my sister was a travel agent and he knew my brother and my nieces and my nephew. Yeah. And then eventually, of course, he put me to work at the store. <laughs> and then I ended up working there full time, so. I mean, it was a dream come true for me. So I love the place, and Eric, such a nice guy, and such a good friend. And I, I figured that I worked in eight different states doing conventions with him. And I saw a lot of bands with him, and I have a partial list of bands that me and Eric saw together. The Cramps, The Creamers, Tom Jones, The Turtles, oh, yeah. Nashville Pussy, Devo, The Ramones, Metallica, The Collins Kids, The Righteous Brothers, Mike Turner, Alice Cooper, The Monks, The Human League, The Third Bardell, Arthur Lee and Love, Grand Funk Railroad, Mountain, Little Richard, Ann Margaret, Ronnie Dawson, the Damned, L7, Roxy Music, The Fenderman, The Bobettes, Haunted Garage, Ministry, Danzig, Sleepy La Beef, Foreign Object, The Muffs, Ronnie Spector, The Go-Go's, Janice Martin, Jerry Lee Lewis, The Premiers, Keely Smith and Sam Butera, Nancy Sinatra with Lee Hazelwood. <laughs> Yeah, he's, he is a super generous guy. You'll hear a lot of people say that about Eric. But to me, he was really thoughtful. Like, if he knew there was something I liked or someone or a review of a show I went to, he would cut it out of the newspaper and give it to me. And whenever he saw something at a convention for something like, oh, I know someone that collects this, I'm going to get this for them. Or, he was always thinking about other people. And I'm, I'm really lost at this moment. Like, Eric was a big part of my life. I mean, I talk to the guy every day. And I'm so glad. He would have loved to see all you guys out there. And, oh, and I hope he's up there talking to Bobby Phil or finding out what really happened. <laughs> 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 yeah, so I'm going to hand it to John. see all those bands, but I saw some of them, most of them, well, half of them, brother. Uh, yeah, well, I don't know, it's been too long. A geeky kid at 15, looking for a summer job that turned to uh, extreme joviality, chaos, and everything else. So, back in 1980, the year of Empire Strikes Back. <laughs> Jeez, that ages me. Uh, yeah, Jim was just stuck, you know, I just, uh, the other guys hired me there to do uh, some work to help out in remodeling and stuff, and uh, Eric came stumbling in and looked at me and said, hey, who are you? <laughs> oh, I'm John, I'm working. Oh, okay. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and that was it. I was excited. So I was like, okay. Yeah, thanks, eh? So, I'll get the phone. So. <laughs> Take a message or something, for sure. Is there a call? Is there? Can I answer? 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 Can I I don't know, there's just too many memories, too many uh, chaotic moments, too many everything. Um, you? Yeah. <laughs> it must be Sorry. hundreds of people who worked for Eric in some capacity over the years. Because I just mentioned people sometimes, Eric said, I think I worked for me. Like, years ago, I was in the store, and somehow I maybe was playing something, and I mentioned the, this old British band, Peter and the Test Tube Babies. And he said, oh yeah, Peter worked here. <laughs> 
Pierce. Jack Needy's been stranded in LA for a month and hired to paint the store. I'm like, you can't work there at some point. I painted it with Peter. And so he painted the store with Peter while he was test tube babies. 15 years old, painting with Peter testing and testing. Nice guy. And that says something too when you have a memorial and Diane Thorne, Ilsa She Wolf, the SS herself, calls the shots to say. Anyway, uh, just, I don't know, he just turned me on to so many movies, so many music, so many people, so many everything, just uh, got me hooked on all my favorite movies, now I'm a big ass movie geek, so what can I do? <laughs> I, I love your pops, and watch some movies up there, will you? <laughs> Oh boy, there's so much. Um, back in 1976, I was living in a place called the Garden Court Apartments, a very weird place in Hollywood in Sycamore. And this woman I contacted drove out all the way from Kentucky with her daughter and 14,000 window cards. And she said she hated where she lived. Do you have a place that I can stay for a while? I said, yeah, okay. So she shows up. So I had gone to conventions in my life, but I'd never actually been a dealer of any kind. So I found out there was a convention going on down the block at a hotel. So I put a suitcase full of window cards, went in, found Doug Wright, the promoter. <laughs> said, hi, I'm just I'm trying this for the first time. Do you have any tables left? He said, yeah, I had a couple cancellations. I said, okay. So I sit down at the table. And I said, I don't even know how to price these things. So I'll start with a $1, $2, $3, $4, four stack, see what happens. You know, I'll go from there. So 60 seconds later, a guy's standing in front of me. Hi, my name's Eric Caden. Um, yeah, let me get a bunch of these. So he buys like 30 or 40 of them. You know, then a bunch of other dealers come up, people I still know to this day. This was 39 years ago. And so I raised the price a dollar in each stack, and Eric comes up again and says, that's still pretty good. Let me get another coming. <laughs> so I did this a few times, and finally the dealers stopped coming up. And I said, okay, now I can start selling to the public. So then I told Eric, I just lived a few blocks away at Garden Court, and he said, oh, great. He's, I gave him my address, so a couple of days later, he shows up at my apartment, he comes in for hours and buys about 100 more. <laughs> and, uh, and he was still going to school in Colorado at this point. This was 76, and he said he was going to open a store. And uh, we became really fast friends because we found out we both loved Freddie Blassie and wrestling. <laughs> He's the only one I know who liked as many categories as I do because we like movies. Uh, like I said, wrestling, we hit the clubs. So we started hitting the Olympic Auditorium every couple of weeks. Um, he finally got around to opening the store the next year, and one of his first employees was my sister, Lynn. And she said, I don't really have a place to stay at here in town. He said, well, you can just stay in the back of the store. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so she'd wake up and be at work. <laughs> so. Eric was, you know, so hard to capture him because he was a really, so I'm going to try to mention a few things he did that were fairly unique. Um, we became, we were very good friends with Ann Robinson. I don't know if she's here tonight, but uh, anyway, she would come over to Eric's house. By this point, I was going to Eric's house. He was coming to my apartment. And we'd have, we'd party and show 16 millimeter movies for New Year's <laughs> Eve. So one night we were out, this could only happen to Eric, we were out at her place in some canyon, I forget which one, with a little narrow road leading to the house. And so Eric, we had a few drinks, Eric had a few drinks, and it got to be one or two in the morning. We said, well, I guess we'll go, Eric. See, I gotta be somewhere in the morning, probably had to be at a convention at 7 a.m., you know. So I said, Eric, are you sure you're okay? Yeah, I just gotta get home, and blah, blah, blah. I said, okay, so he gets in his van, drives off, no lights on this highway, so he gets a mile or so around, and he manages to go veering right off the road. And the, and the van just went rolling all the way down the side of this hill, landing in this canyon, right? I wouldn't be here today if, I, if I'd been in there. The thing finally comes to a stop. Eric climbs right out the window, not a scratch on him. It says, well, I guess I better hike back up and find a phone. So he went up back up the side of this mountain, walked down to the street, found a house, knocked on the door, and said, yeah, my van just rolled down the side of this hill. I couldn't think I could use her phone. And he got help and got home. So kind of amazing that he would, you know. Yeah, probably didn't phase him, because knowing Eric very little phased him, and most of you go, oh, okay, that's right. Yeah. I gotta get the van fixed now. And I said, yeah, but, you know, you're still here. And uh, 
So anyway, in, in 1990, uh, they deregulated wrestling in California. So three weeks later, Eric and I had our first show, Hollywood Heavyweight Wrestling. And uh, it was a very progressive show for its time. And we had a mixture of lucha wrestlers coming in. Rey Mysterio Jr. wrestled in our opening match. I gave him the name Giant Killer. And naturally, Eric said, well, wait, there's another room over there. We, I can run a wrestling movie program all night, too. And I said, okay, because we already have wrestling in three bands playing. And then I said, oh, wait, there's another little room. I can have a little dealer's room, too. So now we got dealers, wrestling film program, a full wrestling card, and three bands playing, which were all seven, the Tommy Knockers and the Mind Readers, a great instrumental group. And then we did this again three or four weeks later at the Club Lingerie. And then we... It was tr tricky because this show was way ahead of its time. So in 1995, Eric and I started up a thing called Incredibly Strange Rock and Roll Wrestling, which we did at Hollywood. A lot of the wrestlers are here tonight. And a lot, some people don't know this, but Eric would come up with these really weird wrestling personas, usually in a mask. And his favorite one was D.T. Dunphy. This was a guy who was a complete drunk and had the DTs so bad, you know, <laughs> and he could hardly get into the ring. And he, his, his biggest match was he would wrestle a six foot tall cardboard skeleton, Halloween skeleton. And he just thought it was an opponent. He did, you know, that's the character he did. And he could go in and have a match with the skeleton and figure out a way to actually have the skeleton pin him and win the match. <laughs> And he actually had an appearance scheduled last week as D.T. Dumpy at an Andy Kaufman uh, tribute. So, so he did a lot of things like that over the years. And Eric had plenty of little eccentricities that he would be stubborn about. He wouldn't back down. 20, this went on for about 20 years. I'd go with Eric for fried chicken a lot. He did coffee shops or, or KFC or you know, churches. And I'd always go in and I'd say, Eric, what do you want here? About, you know, we're going to order. You want you like drumsticks? Love drumsticks. It's, it's great. Well, how about thighs? I love thighs. And how about breasts and wings? Ah, they're okay, but I, you know, I like thighs and drumsticks. I said, okay, so how about dark meat? Oh, no, I won't eat dark meat. <laughs> and I would explain to him that dark meat was, was drumsticks and thighs. He said, I like drumsticks and thighs, but don't order me dark meat. <laughs> So I ordered, you know, drumsticks and thighs and all that. And, and, but this one went on for 20 years. He never would back down on this thing. And yeah, we went to God, we'd hit clubs and uh, everything under the sun. I mean, just three or four. And I moved up to Alameda and Oakland six years ago, and I still saw Eric almost as much as I did in Hollywood because he traveled so much. He was up there 10, 15 times a year. So I got to go out with him for Chinese food a couple weeks ago. And he came over and I showed him part of WrestleMania because he didn't have, he couldn't take things anymore at home. Another interesting thing about Eric is the last several years he managed to keep, he never went on the internet. Uh, he, had, he didn't have his own Gmail address, he had no computer at home, the store had Gmail addresses and they would do things, Eric wasn't on Facebook, but he was still putting all these things together. You know, film programs, he just had a program here, those kitty matinees for adults, right? And he would do all this with just a cell phone. And that was it, he could use the phone, he'd, he'd still go out and make thousands of flyers and put them all over town, doing these things he'd been doing for 30, 40 years. And I'd say, Eric, I don't know, this internet thing could kill you. No, 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 I don't do <laughs> He said, maybe someday I'll get a computer here and someone else can figure it out. You know. And he didn't text either, the phone was just the phone. That if he texted so, him, he didn't know what to do with it. That was so either. funny. Eric, Eric, Eric was a handler of a lot of people. Lot of, you know, he worked with Sid Haig a lot, he worked with uh, Steve Rails back. He actually handled Marilyn Chambers and a lot of porno stars. And this is kind of like a serious job where you have to make sure they're getting paid by the convention, they have the right photos and things to sell. And so Eric, you know, that's another thing he did that I, when I found out, I was kind of surprised that he was handling something like that. So Rob Van Dam is a current wrestler who's still very famous, you know, works with WWE, and, and Eric handled him because he was a comics and movie fan and all that. So I don't know, I think this was about half a year or so ago, some show was coming up, and Eric left word at the store, Scott and I think John were there, and so Rob Van Dam came in and they said, Eric's been trying to get a hold of you for weeks. And he said, I texted him six times. <laughs> everybody just fell down on the floor. And, you know, Eric didn't know what a text was. He didn't want to know. 
And half the time the phone didn't work very well either. It would be all garbled and say, Eric, I can't hear you. So, oh, I, I dropped the phone in the toilet. Yeah, I gotta get it. He <laughs> dropped the phone in the toilet more than anybody I've ever met. Yeah. And if he was on the freeway or something in dangerous traffic, he'd still answer the phone. <laughs> he'd call over. He would actually he'd he'd try. But he'd say, listen, I can't talk right now. I'm on the freeway. There's a cop behind me. And I'd say, why'd you answer the phone? <laughs> Oh, yeah, I'll pull over and I'll call you back. Yeah. So he just he just went on like this, you know, forever. So all, all, all I'm going to say is he was a really great, generous guy. He knew everybody from Jerry the King Lawler to John Waters, you know, people in every category. And um, it was great doing the wrestling shows with them. So all I can really say is if there's no dark meat in heaven, you're going to have to stick with drumsticks. You know? <laughs> Sid's another old friend of Eric's, known him since the 70s. Oh, geez, yeah. Yeah, I probably met Eric about two weeks after you did. Yeah. And, and it was out at uh, LAX Marriott for one of the old Equicon shows. Oh, yeah. And, and yeah, I, I was 15, right, right around there. I, what, what year did you say that you... Uh, 76. 76, yeah, yeah, that's about right. Um, we were in the downstairs lobby, and I had, you know, there was a lot of like, there was, there's not the people that are into like the splatter movies back then, you know, like, like, like there is now. And, and so I wanted to find out more about these Herschel Gordon Lewis movies, and, you know, I'd seen, I, I'd seen some, and, and nobody else had even heard of them. And, and you and Eric were in the, in the lobby. And that's how we struck up a friendship. We, we, we all met at the same time. And uh, he's the only one that, you know, the two of you were the only ones who really knew about Herschel. And, and years later, he put together a Herschel, the Herschel Gordon Lewis Film Festival downtown. And uh, I went to Eric's house, uh, well, his father's house, you know, Stan's, Stan's place in on Roxbury there. And uh, you know they they had a party with Herschel there and, and some other people. And I talked to Herschel. I said, "Listen, uh, I, I kind of want to cover one of your well, a song from one of your movies with my band." He said, "Oh, which one?" And and, and I said, "Well, the Monster Go Go. I want to do the Monster Go Go thing." He said, "Well, you know, I wrote that under a different name, so I guess I have the rights." I go. Really well, you know how do how do I get the rights from you to do the song? I mean, can we work out a deal? He said, "I'll give I'll give you the song, one dollar." <laughs> and and Eric's father happened to be, you know, he was one of the, he was a big lawyer, entertainment lawyer. He wrote out a thing for us in the other room. <laughs> Money exchange hands, all one dollar. And and then and then I said, you know, Herschel. The, the song's only like uh, 30 seconds long. It's going to need some more verses to it. So we went in the other room, came up with some verses together. So that's how I got a, a songwriting credit with Herschel Gordon Lewis. Wow. Um, and it's all due to Eric. Yeah. But, but Eric, uh, it's funny, we were at the lingerie club one night. And uh, he. I think we saw at the same time there was like a hundred dollar bill on the ground. Um, and Eric real quick went over and put his foot on it. You know, hoping nobody saw that they they lost it. And he's like and, and he stayed in the same spot for for like like this this band did their entire set. It had to be like a forty-five minute set and it, it got to be toward the end of the set. And he says, oh man, I really gotta pee. Can you stand on it for a little while? So I'm like, yeah, okay, Eric. You know, so, so I'm standing on it. And he comes back and he's standing on it again. Finally, he gets up his nerve at the end of the set, you know, the, the band's breaking down. He's doing the old, I'm tying my shoe. And he picks it up, puts it in his pocket. And, and we've done a convention earlier in the day. 
And so he had a big wad of money. Yeah, he always had, always had a big wad of money in his pocket from doing the convention. Crumbled up 20s falling out of his pocket as he walked. Down yeah, the yeah, yeah. Hotel um, hallway. And he counts his money up. He says, oh man, you know, I lost $100. <laughs> It was his money that he had been standing on all that time. So that's it. Yeah, that's it. But but all those all all that time that went by, you know, from from '76. I mean, he was one of my best buddies, and I'm gonna miss him so much. I'm gonna miss those phone calls and. Uh, yeah, I, of course I worked for her too for, for a little while, and he, he actually kind of showed me the ropes, and and now I'm doing it myself, you know. Uh, but we're going to miss him. Yeah. Yes. And I think that, you know, he, the fact that he died seeing a movie, you know. He went to a movie, sat in his seat to watch that light dancing up on the screen. And then he walked into it. And there's no better way for a movie guy to go. Thanks. We can talk a bit about Hope of Gordon Lewis there. If you see that, we invite up Jimmy Maslin, who is an old friend of Eric's and also uh, worked with Eric in acquiring the rights to uh, most of Herschel Gordon Lewis's films in the late 70s. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, I used to see Eric, we used to do the rockabilly thing with Ray Candy at the Whiskey, and Eric would always be in the mosh pit. And uh, so one day after the show, he, come after, he came after that, to me after the show, and I said, Eric, I saw this movie, I didn't know, any, I didn't know about the film, I saw, I saw this movie, Blood Feast. And uh, I lived near UCLA, and I found out they'll pay like 150 bucks at UCLA for it to show a movie. I said, I'd like to try to find out about this movie, Blood Feast. I didn't know anything about it. And he goes, that's Herschel Gordon Lewis, that's the very first Gore movie. He goes, if you want to do something like that, I'll kick in with you. So it sort of gave me the impetus to do this. And uh, Eric and I became partners for years. We did the uh, yeah, we did the Herschel Gordon Lewis Film Festival at the Variety Arts Center, the John Waters Film Festival. Um, met so many great people through Eric. Uh, uh, Mike Rainey, uh, Ivy and Lux, uh, Michael Sunny, Dookie, uh, just tons of people. Uh, Eric was just a very generous, Getting person. Um, I remember uh, one funny memory was we, he was doing a screening of World's Greatest Center with Timothy Carey and, uh, at the Beverly Hills screening room, and uh, he invited uh, Stan Caden came, and then Timothy Carey got in, stayed in front of the stage talking about he used to do this poetry before the show. Like too fat or not too fat, <laughs> and Stan like started yelling here, here. What the fuck did you invite me to? <laughs> anyway, uh, well done, Miss Eric, and uh, great. What a great turnout you got. I mean, amazing to be expected. Discussion of uh, some of the film events Eric did and some of the discussion of uh, Herschel Gordon Lewis and the last couple of things. We're going to take a quick uh, short break from speaking now. I'm going to run a short uh, trailer reel with trailers from a number of films that Eric was involved with over the years and loved. There's a chance to kind of celebrate the things that Eric loved and celebrated. So once I get this out of the way here, we'll just uh, run a short, uh, maybe about 10 minutes of film footage, and we'll come back and let some more people have a chance to get up here and talk about Eric and you know how Eric affected all of our lives and myself too. I need to say some stuff from Eric. Yeah films and old friend Eric's and he wanted me to read something on his behalf. So this is a director Frank Hennelotter. <clears throat> That's a similar experience to a lot of other people have told me too. Eric was my first Hollywood friend. Sometime after Basket Case, I was in LA, entered his store, and somehow he recognized me and we spent a couple of hours talking about our favorite schlock horror movies, which is pretty much all we did over the next three decades. <laughs> Whenever he was in town here in New York or I was in town there, we touched base and usually had dinner and shared stories. And Eric was a hell of a rock on tour. Uh, he knew absolutely everybody, which is true, and stories about them. But the best stories, the funniest stories, were the stories Eric told about himself. For example, how way back when, 
He took acid and tried to drive his car around the corner, but again and again ended up hitting every single parked car on the ground. <laughs> and he would tell us with his marvelous deadpan, which only made it funnier. <laughs> when Something Weird video released a double bill of two 60s counterculture movies, Mondo Mod and The Hippie Revolt, myself and Mike Rainey, whom we tra tragically lost last year, asked Eric and Johnny Legend to do commentary, commentary tracks about themselves during those turbulent years. Eric's LSD adventures are well chronicled, including the aforementioned car story, and I'm glad his voice and personality are so wonderfully preserved in the disc. Honestly, he's hilarious on it. But my favorite, most memorable image of Eric was during one of his New York trips, which just happened to coincide with a record snowfall. Uh, traffic, came, traffic was impossible, giant snow banks were everywhere, and the city had come to a standstill. I remember this was a Fangoria show in like maybe 1991 when Lucio Fulci came out, and literally the train stopped running, the entire city shut down, a blizzard hit over the Saturday night into the Sunday. It was a, it was a huge, huge snowstorm, uh, <clears throat> which absolutely delighted Eric. Like a little kid who had never seen snow before, Eric was climbing every snow hill and taking photos of every snow bank in sight. I don't think I'd ever seen him so gleeful or so giddy. God, God, excuse me. <clears throat> God bless you, buddy. Hollywood will never be the same without you. It's crazy. Um, I'd like to bring up another a friend of Eric's from here in uh, LA, Lisa. Is Lisa? Hi everyone. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Lisa G. I was friends with Eric for about a quarter of a century. I did not work for him. <laughs> I have so many great memories of Eric, like everybody here. I'm a little bit I have three that I'm going to share with you today. The first memory is, for a few years at my house, we had a Thanksgiving tradition where we would invite Eric and the various misfits and weirdos from Hollywood Book and Poster. Anybody who didn't have something to do on Thanksgiving, we'd invite him to my house. So me and John and Scott and whoever, you know, would be in the kitchen <coughs> roasting turkey. And Eric would bring his portable slot machine. <laughs> It's just not Thanksgiving, you know. You don't hear the cha-ching of Eric's slot machine while you're mashing the potatoes. Second memory. At one point in my career as a production manager at Universal Motion Pictures, it's a pretty swanky job. A big shot boss, a huge office, big balcony overlooking the lot. One of the perks that came with the job was I could invite people to lunch, and I actually had a booth in the executive dining room. So I invited Eric. <laughs> Eric showed up with Harry Novak. <laughs> Harry's wife, Carmen, is here also. We lost Harry uh, uh, Carmen? recently. Carmen, is Carmen still here? Carmen's in the back there. Hi, honey. I'm so sorry that we didn't make it to Paris Memorial. We didn't find out about it until after the fact. But he was, a, he was a really great man and a, a really good friend. So anyway, uh, they, Carmen and Harry and Eric were supposed to meet me at my office, and we were going to go down the executive dining room. So at about 1, I hear a bit of commotion out in the lobby area of the offices. And I walk out, and my boss, who is pretty much like second from the top at Universal, um, all of you know a guy like this. He wears dockers and a Bluetooth. And backed up against the wall with um, Harry and Eric pitching him the idea of releasing Wham Bam Thank You Spaceman. <laughs> Third memory. Back in the mid-90s, Eric uh, was gracious enough to allow my band to have a record release party at Hollywood and Poster. It was at the original store, which probably most of you remember had really big display windows from you know floor to ceiling. So as part of the record release party, we had go-go dancers in the display window, 
the party's going great, cars are stopping on Hollywood Boulevard, people are walking in, you know, we're all having a great time. Eric invited a ton of people. And uh, a couple hours into the party, I look up, and the go-go dancers are gone. They had flo flee, fleed, flown, ran away in terror. I look in the display windows, there's Eric in a wrestling mask. <laughs> Next to him is Lawrence Tierney. <laughs> wearing nothing but a Speedo bikini. <laughs> they are now our go-go dancers. <laughs> Seriously, like everyone here, I always remember Eric as being warm and kind and generous and funny and full of amazing stories and a person who really ate up life. You know, he, he lived 20 lifetimes in one lifetime. <clears throat> and I have one last thought I'd like to leave you with. Um, I wish I could claim authorship of this thought, but this was actually said to me by my wonderful friend Carol Kovenick Hernandez who did work with Eric for about 10 years. Um, the day after Eric passed, she and I were on the phone together sharing memories and kind of consoling each other. And Carol said to me, you know, Lisa, you know, Lisa, for a long time now, I felt like my Hollywood has been fading away. My Hollywood. Russ Meyer, Torsetana, Haji, Maui and Normie, all the crazy Ed Wood people, Johnny Ramone, Titus Moody, Bill Roxler, Lawrence Tierney, Tierney Harry Novak, David Friedman, I and mean, I could just go on and on. My Hollywood is fading away. And then Carol said, now with Eric's passing, my Hollywood isn't fading away. It is truly gone. Thank you. I'd like to bring up another old friend of Eric's, um, somebody that uh, Eric also knew from New York originally, who now lives down here too, uh, Howie Pyro. showed up at a chiller convention and Eric comes running up to me. He's like, where, where have you been? Where have you been? I've been waiting for you. You have to come here right now. And I was like, all right. What was before the room closes? I had all these pictures printed up of Linda Blair with her head on backwards and, and the cross. And, and uh, I, she won't sign them. <coughs> and, uh, he's like, you have to go and make get her to sign them. And, uh, and I was like, why, why me? He goes, you can do it, you can do it. And he convinced me to go stand online. And I'm thinking, oh God, what am I gonna say? What am I gonna say? And, I, and I get up there and he's like giggling in the doorway of, of the, at the convention. Just waiting because he is so mad that she wouldn't sign. She ruined his weekend. Uh, and I got up and I, uh, and she was well aware of the photo and, you know. So by the time I got up there, I, I handed the photo and, and she turned deep red and lost her mind and started screaming for security. And that is not me, it's a puppet. It's a puppet, it's not me. Where's that guy? I know who sent you, I know who sent you. you know, like, like, like this whole like, insane like, nightmare ensued. But luckily we were friends with, uh, 
Kevin, who ran the Chile convention, and he kind of uh, pretended to drag me out. <laughs> and me and Eric had to like um, tiptoe around this whole convention for the whole weekend to avoid Linda Blair <laughs> for fear of, of death. <clears throat> I met Eric uh, 29 years ago. <clears throat> For some reason, I got married. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, you were on our honeymoon with us. <laughs> As were about 10 other people, and we stayed at this horrible motel on the corner of uh, La Brea and Hollywood Boulevard. <laughs> Which is the only place we can all afford, and what is it, moving itself. Uh, and on the honeymoon, we came to <clears throat> California because me and my ex-wife were both in the same issue of Famous Monsters of Filmland magazine and, and we bonded over that and uh, when we were kids uh, and we came out to spend our honeymoon with Barry Ackerman <clears throat> and uh, and I was walking down Hollywood Boulevard and I, I saw a Hollywood book and poster the two floor version and uh, I spent my whole honeymoon with Eric. <laughs> um, no, he's not married anymore. No, not married. Nor, <laughs> I never will be. Uh, except for to my dog. Uh, and I, uh, there was a dollar floor upstairs with hundreds of thousands of movie posters. And, and evidently, uh, Dave Friedman had just brought over trunks of really, really rare <clears throat> stuff that wound up up there. And so as the, as the week went on, and I went there every day, and I was just piling up stuff, mostly dollar stuff that I would bring down, and, and every time Eric would just be like, how, how did that get up there? Oh my God, how did that get up there? What, another one? So I just, it just every single thing I brought down there, he said <clears throat> that, and, uh, but he honored all my, uh, posters that I brought down. Uh, and, uh, man, you know, I've met most of my weird idols through Eric. My, my jobs were to, to sit with Marilyn Chambers. I once sat with Marilyn Chambers and Mink Stoll and Ema Sumac and Georgiano Skillin Vampira. Uh, which is probably one of the greatest days of my life. And I also, with Eric, had breakfast with Georgiana Steele at that autograph, at that uh, whatever convention that was, which was uh, amazing. But over all the years, Eric called me a lot to tell me important news, uh, a lot of time about who died. And, uh, but as long as I've known him, he's always, uh, introduced himself on the phone for some reason. I said, Eric, Eric Holly Book. Hey, Eric Holly Book. Um, oh, wait, hang on. Eric Chase and Holly Book. Let me get this And he's one of the few people where that, uh, you know, so many of his messages were worth saving. <clears throat> and I'm still on my phone, but uh, I feel sorry for people that will not get to meet Eric and experience <sighs> just him, you know, schlumping around in that hat with a little piece of ponytail. <laughs> you know, there's so many people with Eric shirts on here. I keep turning around and thinking that he's here, and he is. Bring up another uh, friend of ours in the film world, Mr. Clue Gulliger. Do I, uh, do I win the raffle? <laughs> oh, yeah. I, should have, I should have had a raffle today. I 
wore all this shit because uh, <clears throat> Eric always saw me this way. <laughs> He saw me riding Randolph Scott's old pony that's with the, the sorrel with the flax and mane and tail in the Virginian when I used to put poke, people in a pokey. He saw me mounting Sybil Shepherd on a pool table <laughs> when I had a cowboy hat before the deed. He always looked at me as if I were a smelly cowboy from Oklahoma, <clears throat> which I am. <laughs> and I rode horses. I still smell like a horse. I couldn't ride a horse like Ben Johnson, another Oklahoman, but I could ride. Oh yeah, I could ride. I'm just talking with Brianna, Eric's niece from Texas, uh, she looked like an Indian. I said, Orcio? She said, what? <laughs> I said, that's hello in Cherokee. I'm a Cherokee Indian from Oklahoma, a lot, lot like you. You're from Oklahoma. She said, ah. Oh. I used to uh, live on uh, North Kingsley Drive in Hollywood with my wife Miriam and my son John. He was a little tot. Miriam would get a stroller and push John to Hollywood from North Kingsley Drive, which is a mile or a mile and a half, something like that. And on the way she would pass a swimming school. Jan Lovin Swimming School, and she would always hear a trumpet play loudly. It was Jack Sheldon practicing the trumpet for six hours a day behind the swimming pool. He was Jan Lovin's son. He would always play Carnival of Venice, that famous Harry James tune. And strangely enough, now this, this is weird, my first show in New York City, live television, I played a trumpet, live. I played the Carnival of Venice, and that was really hard. You know that thing? It was hard. Years later, my daughter-in-law, Diane, John's wife, taught swimming there. Earlier on, John, as a little tot, swam there, studied swimming with Natalie Cole. And they were, they were pretty good swimmers for kids. She pushed John on up to the Broadway department store in Hollywood, on Vine in Hollywood, many, many decades ago. I had asked her if she would. <coughs> I was working at Universal, 12 hours a day. I said, could you get me a gift for a friend of mine? She said, certainly. So she went to the Broadway and bought a chair, a makeup chair. And she had put on the back of it the name of my friend, Lou. And I told her how to spell it, L-O-U. <laughs> so, I gave it to Lou Wasserman, and he said, hey man, my name is Bill L-E-W, not L-O-U. I said, oh shit. And he didn't get mad because when he, he bought Universal, he gave me a lot of jobs. I worked there a lot for Lou. He was also a good man. Up the block from the Broadway department store, a few stores, was a Hollywood book and poster shop. I used to go in there. I'd go in there, and there was this guy bent over the counter, a guy from New York, and he straightened up with these glasses, 
and a smile and say, hey, how you going, mister? I knew he was happy. I misread it. He was not happy. <laughs> inside, he was churning. And he was saying inside, I hope this guy buys something. <laughs> I hope, I hope, I hope, because they weren't doing so well. So I went on up the aisle, and I came to a large man with a little cap on and a ponytail. And he looked at me innocently, like he wanted to drain and steal every bit of knowledge I had. I was wrong. He was churning inside. <laughs> he was saying inside, I hope this guy buys something. <laughs> they weren't doing so well. So I went on up the aisle, and there was this guy, older man, distinguished, looking with glasses, you just saw him up here. And he looked up, very friendly. I knew he, he liked my face immediately. I was wrong. He was churning inside. He was saying inside, I hope this guy buys something. They weren't doing so well. So later on, we skipped to the film noir festival of my dear friend Alan a very dear man. It's Phil Noir Festival in Palm Springs. This is a rough one for me, kid. And we were sitting out in front of Sherman's Deli, the biggest deli in that part of the nation. A friend of mine started it from Topanga Plaza in Woodland Hills, where I was mayor at that time. He was busboy at this, and he saved all of his money. And he was so gracious to my wife and me and little John when we went in there to eat bacon and eggs. And he started Sherman's Deli later on in Palm Springs. It became a huge success. And it's beautiful, beautiful food. So Eric and Clue and David and Bill we're all sitting around outside in this beautiful desert sunshine, eating a late breakfast. And somewhere way back in me, I felt a churning. And it was Eric's belly. It was saying, why the hell didn't you buy something? <laughs> you should have bought something. You should. We went under. You well, Eric, I didn't have any fucking money. I was a project man, like you. I was a showman, like you. I put my money in shows, like you. I had no money, I'm sorry. I would have bought every goddamn poster you had if I'd had the money, Eric. So Eric went away that night. And I'm hoping that he took some money with him so he could somehow get someone to work for him and start up a shop, a poster shop next to Dark's Delicatessen on Burbank Boulevard in Burbank. And he could run it with his money through these guys. and the churning would stop, see? We all realized the minute Eric died that there are angels among us who are gracious and kind and sweet and good.
I wanted to say in relation to that, kind of something I said before too, is uh, Eric was not in the business of making money, I really think. Uh, Eric was in the business of making friends. Um, you know, the times I've helped Eric over the last 25 years of conventions and things, I would try sometimes to take my logical, mathematical side and try to talk to him about business. Like, you know, Eric, you should really balance your checkbook and not just send checks out willy-nilly. Or, you know, you should account for the wholesale cost of these things when you sell them because you're not really making a profit on this show. But it didn't matter Eric, because Eric was really in the business of meeting, meeting people, sharing his love of things with them, and, and finding out what they loved. And, you know, so I'm sure Eric is... Probably got a poster shop going right now. It's probably losing money, but he's probably made a ton and ton of new friends at this point already. I also want to read one more thing from somebody out of town before I go on to some other people here. There are a lot of people here I want to speak, and hopefully you guys have some time to stick around here. But um, this is something written by an old friend of mine, the person I uh, met Eric through initially. And um, <clears throat> I'm 47 now, and I've gone through a lot of different periods of my life where different things were really important to me. As a, a kid growing up in the 70s, like a lot of us here, and like Eric and a lot of people, mo monster movies were really important to me. You know, monster movies and classic comedies, two things Eric and I shared a love for. Uh, we would go to the, uh, the uh, Sons of the Desert meeting up in Burbank, um, you know, every couple of months. He'd say, I got an extra pass, let's go to the Laurel Hardy Club meeting, or we'd go see uh, Three Scooges shorts every Thanksgiving. It was a tradition. Somehow I ended up in LA on business trips in Thanksgiving, even a few years before I moved out, we'd always go to the Alex Theater in Glendale. And like, like Eric, I grew up loving monster movies and, and classic comedies. And then as I you know, hit my teens, around like 79, 80 or so, hit 12 or 13, uh, punk rock became really important to me. I kind of forgot about a lot of the stuff I loved as a kid and immersed myself in that world. And then as that kind of lost its luster for me as, as the 80s wore on, um, through that world is how I met Eric. Um, this is something from my friend uh, Jamie Sharapa, uh, an old friend of mine from, I grew up in New York, it's an old friend of mine from Boston. Um, for those who know some early 80s Boston history, he was the bass player for a band called SSD Control. It was a, uh, an early, one of the first real Boston hardcore punk bands. And uh, Jamie met Eric uh, probably around, the, I think it was the late 80s, he was playing in a band from Boston called Slapshot and came out here and met some other people I'll introduce who um, were friends of Eric, who had other bands in LA. And Eric was putting on a benefit show uh, to raise money for Jack Baker, who I think was fighting cancer at the time. And um, so my friend Jamie came out here and knew some other friends and bands and got him, his band to play this benefit show and that's how he met Eric. Uh, and for, from what I recall hearing at the time, the benefit lost money. Um, typical with many things with Eric, it didn't really make money, but many, many long-term lifetime friendships have come out of that event like many things Eric did. And so my friend Jamie met Eric at that show and let me read out what he says here. <clears throat> In memory of Eric Doc Caden. Uh, like like Eric, my uh, vision is going, so I do the, the Eric, like, look over my glasses thing now. Anyone who's spent time with Eric or watching him you know, reading the newspaper or something, and you think, how is he looking through his forehead and seeing something? Like that? <laughs> In memory of Eric Doc Caden, it's obvious to anyone who knew Eric how incredibly kind and generous he was. In fact, you barely had to know him to recognize that. He treated you like a celebrity whether you were one or not, or whether he knew you for 20 years or had just met you. He brought so many people together because he would always be doing something cool or meeting someone cool, and he would always include you. Whether it was hanging out with the Ramones in Vegas, meeting Fari Ackerman for a midnight snack at House of Pies, or making a run down to Tijuana to buy wrestling masks, the Eric Cain experience always made for a great story the next day. Personally, what I'll miss most are the countless hours spent with him at conventions and movies and seeing bands and just listening to his endless stories and incredible knowledge of obscure films, music, Mexican wrestling, and all things cool. I'm so thankful for all those memories. He was a true character. Everyone that knew him had a story about him, and every story he told about him required that you do your best impression of Eric to get the true effect. He was a rock star, a Hollywood legend. I'm glad he was my friend. I'm glad he was my friend. He'll be forever missed by us all. James Sharapa, June 1st, 2015. I'll just use that to segue into how I met Eric. Um, so I had known Jamie since the 80s of the punk rock world, and at this point in my life, I think I was looking for something else to give me kind of direction. And uh, I had sort of rediscovered the, my love of monster movies and things of that sort from my youth. And uh, Jamie also shared that love for me. He had uh, Lon Chaney's senior tattoos around his waist, complete tattoos of all his various roles. We, we love these kind of things. And he had met Eric at this show he did out here, and then told me this is a, a fall of 1990. Hey, there's this is. Uh, Monster Movie Convention happening in New Jersey, Chiller Theater Convention. Uh, it was the first one they were having. 
And he said, I'm gonna come down from Boston. Let's go down, I'll crash at your, your parents' place. Let's go to this convention. And so we go to the convention. It was a small convention this time, just a small thing in a theater about this size. The guests were Diane Thorne, Ilsa Shewell the SS, uh, Jonathan Harrison lost his face, and Zach, the great Zachary Lee from uh, New York uh, Children's Theater and all. And so Jamie, as we get there, Jamie said, I, I know this guy, Eric, let's go stop by his table. So we went over to, and this was October 27th, 1990. I remember the date because I saw an old uh, flyer for the show. Took me over to Eric's table and introduced me to Eric. And of course, like I said earlier, I think within 20 minutes, I was probably working at Eric's table. At some point, hey, watch my table. You know, here's, here's the point of cost and everything. So right away, I'm working for Eric. I barely met the guy. And it was a really important day for me. You know, I met Eric that day. And uh, that was the same day also that I became friends with uh, Johnny Ramon, who was a friend of Eric's. And I think is Linda here. I think I see Linda out here. Um, and again, just standing at Eric's table and, you know, when you were around Eric, there were always interesting people coming by and you know, standing there. And Johnny came by, and obviously I'd seen his band many times, knew who he was, and running through on the street. But then with Eric, you meet people and you just talk to them and suddenly you're exchanging phone numbers and becoming friends with people. And from that point forward, literally from the moment I met Eric, uh, Eric was a friend. Anytime he would come to the East Coast for a convention, he'd always call me and I'd go work for him. And initially at the time, I had a low paying museum, crappy job, um, and I could use the money. But it became a thing where it was, it was more about going to hang out with Eric. And later on, I, I got a very good job working at Miramax and did very well for myself, but I would still come and work for Eric for free at all his conventions, no matter how busy I was, just because it was always so fun and interesting hanging out with Eric. You'd meet so many interesting people, and you'd never know what happened. There was always some goofy story. There was always something that would happen with Eric. You know, there's, you know, and you don't want to tell these stories that seem like we're making fun of Eric, because you're not. It, just, it was just so much joy of life being around Eric. And from that point forward, I did all, all these conventions with him in New York. And then I would start doing conventions in Florida with him. We'd go down twice a year to do these Disneyana conventions and sci-fi conventions. And we'd spend, we started going, we'd go for like three days for the convention weekend, then six days, then seven. I think at the max, we would stay there for 12 days because we just have so much fun going down there, meeting people. And we would go twice a year uh, with myself, Eric, uh, Johnny and his wife would go. We'd have it was a really interesting experience. And um, maybe I'll tell uh, one story about one of those things just to give a sense too how you couldn't get mad at Eric. You know, even when Eric would do things that would annoy you or drive you crazy or you would just not understand what he was doing, you couldn't get mad at him because he really was just just a big kid. You know, and he just he had just a you know the way kids just enjoy life and the wonder of everything. You know, the smallest things could get Eric excited.